consider here. Okay, so yeah, this is this is joint work with uh, my collaborators who are actually visiting me right now at, at WT. So first off, the motivation here. Um, the basic motivation for this talk and the connection to uh, hardware, which is why it's in the session here, is power consumption. So there's a lot of interest right now in uh, millimeter wave transceivers. We saw this example in the previous talk. There's applications of millimeter wave for wireless LAN, for PAN, for wearables, and for 5G cellular. And one of the features of millimeter wave is the extensive use of multiple antennas. Now one of the challenges is that um, as a MIMO person, we would like to use the same kind of processing that we use at lower carrier frequencies, and that typically involves connecting, this is at the receiver, connecting every antenna to an LNA, an RF chain, an ADC, uh, set or a set of ADCs, depending on if you're sampling a baseband or a, uh, some sort of intermediate frequency, and then doing all the MIMO processing in baseband. And that's great uh, you know, from a signal processing perspective, it makes it easier to do software defined radio. You can just build basics to do all the interesting line processing. The problem is when you scale up to millimeter wave, either because of the carrier or the bandwidth, the power consumption of these components that was before very small becomes quite a bit higher. And these are numbers that are kind of averages that we've taken from the literature, both on the published work as well as work that we've uh, seen in terms of uh, chipsets that are available. So these are numbers about in the middle of what you can find. Commercial practice, and if you just sum up all the power consumption, if for even just four antennas, which is not a lot of millimeter wave, this would consume two watts. And that's far too high to have that kind of handset. And if you scale that up to like 64 antennas, of course it goes up by kind of a factor of uh, 16. It's, it's completely infeasible. Now, the, uh, so the basically this motivates, you know, if we want to use multiple antennas, we need to somehow deal with this. And there's essentially two approaches. There's the hybrid beamforming architecture where we're going to put a whole bunch of analog beamforming here and reduce the number of ADCs. And that's something I've studied in my other work, but I'm not going to look at here. And then the approach in this talk, which is where we're going to attack this piece right here, which as you can see, consumes more power than and so that's the motivation for what we call a low resolution millimeter wave final receiver. So the basic receiver, we're, we're focusing on the receiver side. The transmitter would be exactly the same as before. I'm not going to touch that. And we still have that in, in LNA, RF chain at the receiver, but we replace that uh, high resolution ADC with a B bit ADC where B is maybe one, two, or three. So it's, we call it a few bit or you know, low resolution. And then all the processing is still done at baseband, but based on the heavily quantized signal. And then you get the two different signal models. The normal MIMO signal models, like Y equals HS plus V. If you have one bit, you get just a sign. This is a sign in real and imaginary. Otherwise, you get a, a quantized signal there. And when you use just one, two, or three bits, one of the challenges is that um, treating uh, the noise or Treating this nonlinear operation as approximately uh, something linear plus Gaussian noise doesn't work very well. It works well for, for several bits. Uh, so that changes the signal processing, the information theory, a lot of the analysis. It makes it more challenging. Um, but one of the things is despite that, it is still possible to get reasonably good, if not outstanding, uh, capacity with this setup. And uh, we have in another uh, paper derived the bounds, either bounds or the exact capacity, depending on the configuration of the MIMO channel with one bit ADCs, with child state information of the receiver and transmitter. And, uh, and basically, over, with a few antennas over the most usable SMR, you can get almost the same capacity as with perfect CSI everywhere, with infinite resolution. So that's very exciting. Um, one of the main challenges, which I probably won't get into today, is the baseband complexity. Implementing a lot of receiver signal processing algorithms requires uh, more complicated algorithms. I'll talk about one today, but I won't talk about like the detection. I'm just going to talk about the channel estimation. And then one of the things that we've learned in our work is that uh, it's actually uh, quite beneficial to know the channel. Um, it helps to know it at the receiver, but it's very helpful to know it at the transmitter, especially when you have one bit. And the reason is that when you don't know the channel and you're trying to design these signals, um, it's possible to have two signals sort of collide together so that they show up in the same sign output here. And so you have to design a signal set such that after the quantization, those constellation points still remain far, if that makes any sense, despite going through the channel. And if you know the channel, you can manipulate the signals such that they go through and leave you with a lot of points that leads to high capacity. So 
So the channel is, is actually very important um, if you want to implement that and get all the, the highest capacity you can. Now the challenge though, and this is where we get the channel. Um, channel estimation at millimeter rate actually is it's a challenge because we don't have that conventional MIMO civil processing architectures. We either have the hybrid approach or some other structure that means that we see the channel through the lens of, of the analog. And so we don't get access to the channel itself, we get access to the beam formed channel. And so if you want to estimate the channel itself, you need to apply some sort of procedure to, to decouple the analog piece from the actual channel. Another thing is that the bandwidth is wide, but the power is not much different. And so the SNR can be very low. So you're trying to do this channel estimation with really low SNR, like less than zero dB in many cases. And also the dimensionality. Uh, some of the configurations we look at for 5G cellular, 256 antennas at the base station, uh, maybe 16 at the handset. I mean, it could be 64 and 2 or 64 and 4, but the channels are big. And if you add the, the 1 to 80C, um, in addition to that, so you got a fourth little boulder over here, which is the, the fact that it's coarsely quantized. And so you have all the challenges you had before and now the quantization as well. And so some of the work that's, that's been done so far uh, and in terms of estimation error, you have a few bits. The uh, estimation error decreases at best quadratically per bit. So if you have a few bits, you can probably do pretty well. Uh, also, uh, if you have sparsity in the channel, which means there's structure that comes from not having too many multipaths, then um, things are a little bit better, and the estimation error can actually increase quite a bit if, if there's sparsity here. So there's actually some hope to solving this problem, uh, leveraging the sparsity here. So this is the problem that we consider here. So first of all, we're looking at a, a millimeter wave MIMO channel. It's a narrow band channel. This is a, I think the technical term is the equation two here. Um, but it makes some sense here. So in a physical environment, you've got the array of the transmitter, the array of the receiver, there's a bunch of scatters, there's some angles of departure, some angles of arrival. And you could characterize this channel based on all those multipaths, and you could write it in some matrix form where this is a dictionary of steering vectors corresponding to the different angles. This contains gains, and this contains um, the other steering vector. Transmit, this is transmit, this is received steering vectors here. The problem is that to, to leverage this model directly, I mean, the channel estimation would be, you have to estimate the number of paths, the angles of departure, the angles of arrival of this path gains here. And this leads to, if you have a lot of paths, these matrices here can be very fat. And you have a lot of things to estimate. And it's actually not, not helping all that much. What was shown in, in this paper very early by Parse, and uh, several people have actually rediscovered it, I won't mention their names, but you know, it just keeps getting invented again and again. It's a pretty cool idea is that um, in certain cases, for example, if you have a uniform linear array, naturally extends to a patch array, and even other array architectures, you can uh, rewrite this channel here in a different form, where which is a function of two matrices here, which are actually um, essentially DFT matrices. And then the channel in the middle, instead of being diagonal, ends up being something that sparks. And so this is called a virtual channel model. So instead of essentially having a dictionary that would consist of all possible angles, you have like a quantized dictionary that has a few angles here and a few angles here. And the thing in the middle is a matrix that has some, uh, some coefficients that are big and a lot that are, are very small. And so we're going to assume that structure in this paper here. In particular, we're going to use the, the fact that they are an AT or DFT matrices. So this is good for a, a linear array. And then we're going to exploit this because with millimeter array, there's not too many scattering clusters, usually less than four. And the angle spread is typically not, not very big. It, it can be big. It varies quite a bit. Now, the narrow band receipt signal model looks something like this follows here. So we've got um, a training sequence, which is NT by P, and then a received matrix where we take the observations and we stack them together. And then that matrix is the output of our quantizer. That's why there's the calligraphic Q in there. And it's H times our training plus the noise there. And then inserting the um, representation of the channel in terms of the virtual channel representation, we have AR, H, AT, and so the underlying thing that we want to estimate are the non-zero coefficients of, of HP here. So this is the signal model. And yes, I realize millimeter wave will be wideband, and this is probably um, not the best model, but we've actually done some subsequent work where the, what the, the approach I'm presenting here 
That actually works quite well in frequency selective cases as well. I can comment later on, on how to do that extension, but it's actually not as, as hard as I thought originally. Now, the problem is formulated as follows. We take the vec of that matrix equation here to get a, a what's called a, a measurement vector, and then using the um, you know, product or vec identities here, we can rewrite that as some matrix times our vector, which is sparse, plus our noise here. And then we can write that as something that looks like quantization of Ax plus n, where x is our sparse vector that we want to estimate the non-zero coefficients of, a is our measurement matrix, and n is noise. And if you write it like this, this act now looks like a compressed sensing problem where there is quantization and noisy measurements. So this is a variation of something that's, that's been studied extensively. Now, the prior work on low resolution no meter and channel estimation. So there's been uh, you know, a lot of work on channel estimation, of course, without quantization, right? There's like you know, 30,000 papers on that. Um, and there's been a fair amount of work on channel estimation from a compressed sensing point of view, but, but specifically focusing on millimeter rate, there's not been too much work. We have, at last at Solomar, we presented a nice uh, approach that uh, also takes a compressed sensing perspective and then uses the GAMP algorithm to, to solve. And then we generalize that to wide band case, which is really nice. My co-authors in the back here. And then we have another paper that's forthcoming a book on that's also for one bit, but that uses an adaptive technique. And there's, like, I guess, a couple other papers that have appeared uh, by other authors as well. But this is, generally speaking, has not been a big area of interest, mostly because um, I have to say that the industry people have been very skeptical about using very, very low resolution. And the funny thing is that the, the scenario has happened at least three times. I go to a company, I give a presentation like this, it says one bit stuff, it's really cool. And they say, yeah, yeah, I don't know, it's just all, it's all it's theoretical, it's all work for these and that reason. And I go back six months later, and I've got a guy that's working on it full time. They say, well, you just told me that this wasn't you know, worthwhile, you weren't going to fund my project, this is a useless idea, and why are you paying your own employee to do it? I don't know. Uh, so I think it's a better idea than they want to let on. Maybe they just want all the intellectual property for themselves. But uh, yeah, it's, it's happened several times. So I think it's, it's a good idea. Now, you know what, so now what we're going to do is we're going to look at this from the perspective of adaptive compressed sensing. And so as a starting point, we look at these two bounds that come from prior work on, this is the, the typical bound from non-adaptive compressed sensing, which is the mean squared error can be bounded as a function of the sparsity level S. So if you have low sparsity, the error is smaller. There's a noise variance. Um, the measurement matrix would be least norm. And then of course, analog and the rent is the size of that sparse vector. And what's been shown in adaptive compressed sensing is that you can derive a similar bound with the exception that instead of n log n, you've actually got n. So in principle, you could do the same job with pure measurements. And I have to be a little bit careful in interpreting this because when you have adaptive compressed sensing, the dimensionality of this matrix changes. And so I sort of have it on both sides, but the reality is over there is, is changing. But the, but the idea is that we can reduce the number of measurements possible but it's basically by log of the number of dimensions. So it's not huge, but it's still possible to reduce dimensions. So now I'm going to look at the new algorithm for doing adaptive compressed sensing with quantization and with noise measurements. So the contribution is we have this, this new algorithm. We apply it to millimeter wave. We adapt the training sequence to reduce the mean squared error. And I'll show you performance in terms of resolution, training length, SNR, sparsity level, and compare it to a conventional non-adaptive compressed sensing approach. So the first of all, I'm just going to describe the algorithm at a high level, then I will customize it to millimeter rate. So at a high level, we've got y equals qax plus n, and this is the sparse recovery problem from quantized and noise measurements. If this is not adapted, there's a nice paper that does this already. Um, that's called sparse signal reconstruction from quantized noise measurements via GEM. GEM is the name of the algorithm, it's kind of a cool name. Generalized expectation maximization. And so this is nice because it has both the noise and the quantization. Most compressed sensing approaches they typically neglect the noise and also the quantization, or they may neglect the noise and have the quantization. But this, this actually neglects both. It estimates the noise variance from the data, considers the joint distribution, and in fact, that estimator converges to ML under some, some mild assumptions here. So we're going to present uh, an adaptive version of this. The main idea is we're going to start with a particular measurement matrix, and then um, we're going to use gem, and then we're going to add measurement vectors to that matrix based on what we've already observed and repeat. So that's essentially the idea. And the key thing here is that 
instead of just using like a random, like a randomly selected measurement matrix, we are going to, after we have done the initial set of measurements, we're going to add a new vector that has um, maximizes the correlation with the current estimate. So we want to try to find subsequent measurements that are going to give us you know, more information about what we're trying to estimate. That's the idea. The, the basic procedures, if, if we have a total number of n measurements we want to make, we do a random initialization from, a, from our measurement matrix from the dictionary. We start with n over 2 measurements. And then we add, so basically we start with half of our budget. Then we add like a fourth and then an eighth until we're down to one vector. We just keep adding and adding and adding to reduce the stopping point there. So that's the idea. And at this point in this presentation, we actually go through a total of n iterations. but there's some reason to believe that you know at some point you may have a good enough channel estimates you can actually stop in the middle. We haven't evaluated that yet. So that's the idea. Now let's look at how we do this in millimeter rate. Well, in millimeter rate, that A matrix has a lot of structure because of the product of product. And the AT and the AR, those are Fourier matrices. That's fixed. We can't play with those. All we can play with is the training sequence. So what we're going to do is we're going to add um, <coughs> the training here such that we can maximize that coherence. That, that correlation in the rows of the effective A, which is the combination of all of those things there. So that's the basic idea. And then to implement this, though, uh, the main drawback of this versus like a single shot non-adaptive technique is that we actually have to have some, some feedback in place. And so the feedback is critical because you have to, because the measurement is being done by sending a training signal at the transmitter. And so you have to tell the transmitter which training signal to send. So this is, I think, the main drawback of the algorithm is we need a feedback channel. But in, a, in the case where the system is very asymmetric, I think it's actually reasonable. So if this is the base station with like 256 antennas, and this is the mobile with four antennas, um, it will probably be quite reasonable to have a, a feedback channel that won't take too much overhead there. So that's the idea here. So we'll keep this back. And then um, at the end, during the last step, we'll feed back the channel estimate. Now, in this presentation, we don't do any feedback with the channel estimate at all. Um, our student, uh, Jihuan Lo, is going to present tomorrow a paper that talks about feedback in one bit, with one bit ABCs, but that's not here. So here we just focus on the channel estimate. But he doesn't do the channel estimation, he just does the quantization. So you can combine this paper and that paper to figure out how to do the whole thing. Okay, in a couple minutes I have left, I'll give you some idea of the, the performance in terms of of, of AGM in terms of SNR. So here's like SNR values here. Note that I'm plotting from minus 10 to, to 20. I mean, these are actually reasonable levels for, for millimeter array. And then the basic approach, so all the solid ones here are um, non-adaptive compressed sensing with different uh, sizes, basically different numbers of total number of measurements, and then these are adaptive approaches here. And if you don't have, um, you have very, very low SNR. The basic problem is the adaptive approach actually adapts to the noise, so it doesn't work that well. Because what happens is you take a few measurements, and then you try to start trying to hone in on the channel, but then you end up just picking up the noise. So if you have quite a few measurements, or a little bit higher, sorry, but here if you have more SNR, then actually you can do quite a bit better than the fixed approaches in all cases. The other thing to note here is that, so sorry, I didn't mention this here, but the, um, yeah, OK, I was, I was wrong about the Q. The Q is the number of bits. The Q is like 1 bit, 2 bit, 3 bit, 4 bit. And what you can also see here is that, so this is like infinite bits, and this is 1 bit. And you can see the difference between 1 and infinity is less than 2 dB. So the drawback, you know, the, the, the penalty here of having low resolution ABC in terms of channel estimation, very, very small. And, and that's also true in the non-adaptive case, too. It's even smaller there. So the fact that we're quantizing here is not hurting our channel estimate all that much. Now, let's look at this in terms of the size of the training set P. So P was one of the parameters in there. And then this is mean squared error. So we fix SNR at 5 dB, sparsity level at 8, 16 transmit and receive antennas. And so if you don't have a lot of um, training, there's not really any benefit to doing adaptive because like, if you have like four vectors, you do two, and then you add one to one. It's not much benefit. So the adaptive and non-adaptive are about the same. And then if you have a lot of training, they're also pretty similar. But in this region in the middle where you don't have so much training, the adaptive approach can do quite a bit better, two, two three dB or more, depending on the size of the training set here. So you know it, this is nice. So basically, the, the adaptive approach is working about as well as, in this case, as um, the 
fixed one, and quite a bit better in the, in the important regime where you have uh, less training. And then finally here, here's performance in terms of sparsity level. So now I have SNR, FIDB, this P of 8, so that's 8 measurements, NT and NR is 16, but the sparsity level varies. So the more sparsity, the more coefficients there are to estimate, and therefore, with a given amount of measurements, the worse the performance. And you can see here how the performance of the non-adaptive and the adaptive scales, and the adaptive one scales quite a bit better with, with sparsity here, and the performance improvement is Quite, quite substantial, 5 or 6 dB, depending on the level here. And so, so basically we conclude, you know, all these three observations here about the adaptive approach, except that very, very low noise levels with small um, training code books. Otherwise, it, it outperforms the fixed approach in all these cases, of course, at the expense of having that little feedback channel to help us do the adaptation. So yeah, so that's basically the conclusion here. So it works with training. It's going to help us minimize the downlink overhead of the training, the expense of the uplink feedback. It works with different sparsities. Um, and then, of course, if you have the ability to make a lot of measurements, like maybe in the cellular setting, you're going to broadcast a lot of pilots for various purposes. And maybe there the adaptive approach doesn't make sense. But if you've got um, you know, it's something where you don't have as many users, you can train every user individually. This would make a lot of sense to me. And then I think the, the main punchline here is that Despite having quantization, which can be rather severe, it doesn't have a huge impact on the performance of channel estimation at all. And so I think that a lot of these techniques that we're looking at for recording via low resolution, uh, LIMO, and also millimeter wave, the, the channel is certainly not going to be a problem. We can assume that the channel is known pretty well there and then develop techniques based on the channel. So that's it. Right, right. Or you could probably 
So we've done the way that it would work. Yeah, we have done that to actually a massive line model, but we have yeah, done exactly that to compensate for the case where you don't have a uniform linear array, you have another array geometry or miscalibration. So we looked at that there. So yeah, it could work here. But I, I think if if this approximation though is good, I, I'm not I'm not sure that you can sparsify more. Do you more I don't think so. Okay. Thank you. More questions? Yeah. Yes. So uh, uh, you said there were performance results that uh, the the, basically, the difference in uh, uh, I don't know that when you quantize it with one bit yeah. and with infinite bits, it's uh, two dB. Uh, so how uh, yeah. big can it be so that it's uh, negligible for you? For two, like is two dB negligible or? Yeah, that's a good question. So the missing piece here, which is in fact the slide I deleted because I don't believe the result. Um, that we need to plug that we need to like plug this into the, either an achievable rate or a bit error rate, right? <laughs> to, to figure out how much what's the value of a certain amount of mean squared error. And so that piece is like not it's not here, so unfortunately I can't say um, for well, sure. So one more thing is that like you usually say uh, for example that the same performance yeah. you get like a difference in the, the, the dB and I see here that it's like five dB, not two dB at the same performance. The, the, the difference between well, probably like less than five dB, but um, I mean, like, is it uh, like is five dB still low, or is it like a, a high value for you? You mean the gap? Or do you yes, the gap. Far? The gap. Yeah. Well, I, I think you know, generally, from a communication engineer, I mean, every dB is important. So I, I, I just believe that five is like super important. But you know, I, I mean, really, I'd like to see like the achievable rate or bit error rate. The problem is that. It's very difficult to derive the exact capacity in this channel. So we have some results on that, but then they assume the perfect channel. So I'm a little reluctant to kind of plug in. The way we normally do it with MIMO is kind of a hack. We say, well, there's estimation error, we add this noise. I don't think we can do that here. So I don't, I don't have a, a curve that I want to present. Yes, we can do bit array simulations, but I don't care about bit array. I want capacity. Okay. I like bit array too, but capacity is better. Put a bit array is fine. Yeah. Okay. So I need one short one, one short question. Yes. So in your scheme, uh, is a channel estimate on the destination or on the use? Well, the estimation is done at the receiver here. So it's done, if you if, if the transmitter is the base station, then it's done at the, the user. If you the transmitter is the user, the receiver is the base station. So. And the, the, the receiver will feed back the channel to the transmitter? The there's two stages of feedback. The first stage of feedback is just which training vector to use. And the second stage is actually feeding back the channel. But we don't do the feedback of the channel here. Uh, Jim Hua does the feedback of the channel tomorrow morning in that session. Okay, so let's stand for it again.